Philippe Pétain is one of those historical figures that lived long enough to become the villain. He saved the French army from disaster at Verdun in 1916 and sailed the French army mutinies in 1917. For his service, he was made Marshal of France, but his collaboration with the Nazis and creation of Vichy France in 1940 had destroyed his reputation and earned him a life sentence upon Allied victory in 1945. The story of Pétain is an interesting one. If he did not collaborate with the Germans, he surely would be remembered fondly in the annals of French history, as the man who saved France in her darkest hour. Interestingly, the man spent the majority of his life in obscurity, and only in his 60s came into the public spotlight, and was almost 90 when he was finally sent to prison. Pétain rests in the epicenter of the controversy surrounding the morality of collaboration. He willingly chose to work with the Nazis, and his actions led to the suffering and death of many innocent people, particularly France's Jews. Pétain's legacy is one of a man who was willing to put his own interests above those of his country, in the name of warping France in his image. He will always be remembered as a traitor and simultaneously as the man who triumphed over the Germans at Verdun and helped win the First World War. This episode will be done in two parts. The first part will cover Pétain's life up to the conclusion of the First World War, and part two will cover Pétain's role in France's defeat in World War II, the rise of Vichy France, and finally Pétain's trial and imprisonment. Before we begin, make sure to like and subscribe, and let me know down in the comments what does the story of Philippe Pétain tell us about justice and morality in times of war. To begin, Philippe Pétain was born on April 24th, 1856, to a peasant family in northern France. He was the only son out of five children to be born to Omar Pétain, his father, who was a farmer and before his son was born, worked in the early photography business. Pétain's mother died when he was just two years old, and when he turned seven, his father remarried and his stepmother moved in. Shortly after that, Pétain was sent to live with relatives. While living with his extended family, Pétain spent a lot of time with his great uncle, a priest who served in the Napoleonic Wars, and told war stories to anyone who would listen. Later in life, Pétain would say that the reason he became a soldier was because of his uncle. At the age of 10, Pétain left home never to return to attend saint Omer boarding school. At first, Pétain wanted to become a priest. At the school, Pétain was the only descendant of French peasants. Most kids came from middle and upper class family backgrounds. The marshal was bullied by his peers relentlessly, and when Pétain was marshal of France, he was asked about his school days, and he said, only equality is won by the fist. The boarding school was demanding. Classes and prayer started at dawn, and students attended classes till late in the evening. They had classes six days a week, and in terms of vacation, the kids only got one month off a year. Pétain was still a student when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870. In France, many believed that the French army was invincible after defeating the Russians in the Crimean War and defeating the Austrians in the Italian Wars. Few took the Prussians seriously, and many believed that the war would be much like Napoleon's war against the Prussians in 1806, marched through Germany with a few set battles. The French people were shocked when the Prussians in a few battles managed to defeat the once invincible French army and even capture Napoleon III. In 1870, one, the Prussians were coming dangerously close to St. Omer boarding school, and the students were mobilized by the army to help field hospitals with the forever increasing number of wounded. They were also ordered to do army drills with wooden rifles. The students were close to the front line and experienced the horrors of war firsthand. Many believed that the Prussians would capture the school, but French general Louis Faber fought a successful rearguard action against the Prussians and saved the school from being captured. Bataan admired the professionalism of the soldiers who saved the school, and this changed the course of his life's trajectory. He would no longer want to be a priest after witnessing war. He decided to become a soldier. Like most Frenchmen at the time, he took the Franco-Prussian war defeat personally, and he felt a need to revenge France's honor. Pétain then applied to the military academy at saint Cree and was accepted to the joy of his family. Going to an officer's school was a massive move up the French social hierarchy, especially for a person from a peasant background. He attended the academy in 1873 and graduated in 1878. For the next two decades, he served in various positions in the light infantry in France. He slowly climbed up the ranks of the army and avoided military assignments in the colonies where most of the officers went to gain combat experience and earn fast promotions. Pétain never spent much time outside of France and only went to Africa once to lead French and Spanish troops in the Rift War in the 1920s. The marshal spent his early military career gambling and sleeping around, and mostly neglecting his military duties. He almost married one woman during this time, but her family wanted him to leave the army, so he basically ghosted her. In the 1890s, he was placed on the general staff and got an office job. By being on the general staff, he entered the military elite and was given a high salary. During this time, Patan had several children from different women, who he also abandoned. While serving in the general staff, he made connections in the French high command and began to study military history. Pétain then became a military instructor with a focus on infantry tactics. He preached the doctrine that firepower kills, 
believing that the infantry and artillery should work in tandem to exploit breakthroughs. He was also invited to be a professor at the L'École de Guerre and preach to officers about the horrors of machine gun fire and the devastating effects of modern rifles. Pathan's focus of study was the evolution of weaponry from the Napoleonic Wars to the present. By 1914, he was on the retirement list, and due to rivals he made throughout his career, he was told that he would never become a general. His career, by all accounts, was over. In the summer of 1914, he said goodbye to the army and was facing a long and lonely retirement without a family. But fate would have other plans for the marshal, and within a few short years, he would earn his place in history. By all accounts, Patan had no idea that war was about to break out all across Europe in the summer of 1914. Neither did most leaders who did not take the prospect of war seriously. Only in late summer did war hang in the air like a thick fog. The Germans planned to bypass the French defenses facing them directly along the German border. Instead, they planned on crashing through Belgium following the Schlieften plan. The French, on the other hand, planned a rapid push to liberate Alsace-Lorraine, and planners did not consider the possibility that the Germans would violate Belgian neutrality. They believed the Germans would not want to draw Britain into the war who guaranteed Belgian sovereignty. Regardless, the Germans poured into Belgium and were met with stubborn resistance from Belgian forts and their small professional army. In the Rhineland, the French offensive stalled almost immediately by machine gun and artillery fire. Joseph Foch, leader of French forces, canceled the Rhineland campaign and switched to the defensive and sent units to southern Belgium to link up with the BEF under Sir John French. Like in the Franco-Prussian War, French soil had to be defended. Petain was called out of retirement and ordered to take command of the 4th Infantry in the 5th Army. He was tasked with forming his company while on the march. Petain struggled to organize his infantry. Most of the soldiers under his command were poorly trained, conscripts, and reservists. Only a handful of regular infantry was in Petain's ranks. The French Army in the early war wore Napoleonic-era red trousers and bright blue wool uniforms and marched in neo-line formations. Few in the French Army at the time knew the realities of war, and none of them had faced a modern army as the Germans on the battlefield. Petain, despite his academic background, had never seen war firsthand and was as inexperienced in battle as the freshly conscripted Parisian bakers and tailors. Regardless, the future marshal put on a brave face and adopted the persona of a kind, charismatic grandfather, which gained the respect of the men. Not only did Petain have to deploy his company on the march, he had to deal with the egos and petty feuds of his fellow commanders, half of whom hated the British and Belgians and refused to work with them outright. Despite the breakdown command, the future marshal was able to navigate the sea of egos with his grandfather persona. On August 10th, Petain reached the front line with his men exhausted from weeks of hard marching. But upon his arrival, he was ordered to march his men to Philippeville to hold a bridge at Teton that crossed the Meuse River. The tired men could barely walk at this point, and officers used sticks to whip the soldiers who collapsed from exhaustion. On August 13th, an advance guard led by Charles de Gaulle tried to take the bridge but was met with artillery and machine gun fire. Like Napoleon and Arcole, de Gaulle tried to storm the bridge but was shot in the leg and was forced to crawl back to friendly lines and use the bodies of fallen comrades as cover. To his dying day, the founder of the Fifth Republic said he could hear the dull thud of bullets entering the bodies of the dead and wounded which lay there. The 4th Infantry shortly followed the Gaulle into battle. Two days later, Petain reached his objective, despite heavy rain, exhaustion, and the endless stream of refugees blocking the roads. On the 15th, Petain was met with an artillery bombardment which killed 600 of his men. Afterwards, he wrote to his superiors asking for permission to dig trenches for cover but was denied. By the 21st, the French had launched a series of offensives against the Germans in the south, each ending and failure. For his bravery, Patton was promoted to Brigadier General and was promised command of a division in the future. Patton took part in the Battle of Guise, and despite the odds against him, he held his own. He was indispensable to the French High Command, and Patton survived the first round of many army purges. By 1915, 48 commanders had been fired, and only seven survived the purge, Patton being one of them. This purge propelled the future marshal up the ranks, and in September, he took command of the 6th Division as a reward and a challenge. The 6th was exhausted from hard fighting and setbacks. When Petain arrived, an officer wrote, the soldiers were like skeletons. They turned their exhausted eyes towards the as yet unknown commander and seemed to implore him to give them some respite from the long catastrophes of their miseries. Petain whipped the men into shape and introduced harsh punishments for looting and incompetence, but still reaffirmed his grandfather persona. By September, the French were fighting on their home territory, retreating more than 80 kilometers and were right outside the city of Reims. Petain led his troops in the first battle of the Marne. After fighting defensively, 
he had artillery pound the enemy and then had his men finally go on the offensive. To raise morale, Patin personally led the charge on his horse and they crashed into the German lines and forced them back. The tables had finally turned and the French went on the offensive and chased the retreating Germans till they reformed their lines. For his efforts, Patin was given the Legion of Honor and given command of the 33rd Army under Ferdinand Foch, his future rival. He was then transferred to fight off the Germans at Arras. Patin was able to help reinforce the front line. He ordered his men to dig deeper trenches and he had his men hide machine guns and he also ordered his men to cover trenches and camouflage. Patel was one of the first commanders to end useless charges against the enemy. As a defensive-minded commander, he was a big proponent of combined arms and refused to waste his men's lives. In 1915, Patan took part in several costly offensives. He first led his men in the failed Atois offensive in July, which ended in failure after the French were able to make some gains with the help of the BEF. During this time, gas was introduced on the battlefield and this deeply shook the morale of the men in the trenches. In autumn, Patan took command of the second army during the Champagne Offensive, which was another costly battle where little ground was taken. In 1916, the Battle of Verdun was the definitive battle for the French during the First World War. The 10-month siege was the linchpin for success and failure for the French people. At the center of the Allied front line rested the ancient city of Verdun that had been a place of conflict since ancient Rome. The fourth city for millennia held France's enemies in check and prevented invasion of the French heartland. It seemed like the fate of the world rested on that massive battle, much like how the fate of World War II rested at the feet of the Russians at Stalingrad. Like Stalingrad, Verdun had a symbolic importance as well as strategic. Out of the 75 divisions that were raised to fight in the First World War, over 50 divisions fought and died at Verdun. The heroic resistance of the French people against all odds embodied the spirit of France. The battle also birthed the Bataan mythos, which turned him into the heroic charismatic father figure. He embodied the spirit and genius of all the great French leaders before him. The soldiers at Fatin viewed him as the man who heroically led the forces of light against the dark. The battle turned Fatin from a mediocre officer into the marshal, the unflinching, steadfast leader who told his men, Il ne passons pas, they shall not pass. In 1916, the front line was at a stalemate, and the Germans craved to break the deadlock and return to maneuver warfare. The German high command believed that the city was vulnerable, and if they took it, the whole front line would crumble. Crown Prince Wilhelm, the Kaiser's son, amassed a massive army around 400,000 men and more than 12,000 artillery pieces, including naval guns. New railway lines were constructed, while sappers fortified their own lines to conceal infantry. More than 150 fighters were also amassed to act as infantry support and scouting. On the other side of the barbed wire lay a poorly fortified French fort. The trenches were in poor condition, and the fortifications at Fedin were stripped bare. The heavy artillery that had once guarded the city was redistributed to other parts of the front line. For all accounts, Verdun was open and almost defenseless. During this time, Patin was promoted to a three-star general and was quickly climbing up the ranks. He was also courting Nina, an on-again, off-again girlfriend. The battle began on February 21st with a devastating artillery bombardment that could be heard for more than 200 miles. The French lines were evaporated by concentrated artillery and anyone who was not deep underground was immediately killed. Once the bombardment ended, the real fighting began. The Germans sent in their storm troops, armed with flamethrowers, into the dazed French lines. Petain was ordered immediately to head to Verdun due to being one of the few generals known to be effective at fighting defensively. He was also the only general not on an active front line. His men, after a year of failed offensives, had been given leave. But now, his army was deployed to defend the city. Patin rushed to the fort and found the city on the brink of chaos. To make matters worse, he was diagnosed with double pneumonia. Patin was bedridden for more than five days and was even close to death. He had to save the city from his bed with a map in hand and he delivered orders from his bedside. While sick, he devised an defensive plan that saved the city. He ordered his artillery to concentrate and then had his men dig in three defensive lines deep within the earth. Patin also devised a wheel strategy where men would be cycled out after serving a short amount of time at the front line. He did this to preserve the morale of his men, who could not stay in the trenches for long. Patin spent a great deal of time with his engineers, who added running water to the trenches by laying underground pipes. The engineers also expanded the roads to increase supply leading into the city, so the wheel could turn more effectively. Prince Wilhelm led several daring offensives against the French. 
first attacking on a different flank and then marching on a broad front. These attacks slowly strangled the city, but thanks to Batan's trench system and artillery coordination, he was able to hold off the massive offensive thrown against him. This was largely thanks to the help of his two corps commanders, General Robert Nevelle, a silver-tongued, charismatic, English-speaking cavalryman, and Charles Magan, who spent his whole career fighting throughout the French Empire. By summer, Batan was promoted to commander of all armies in the center line by Joffre, who wanted Batan out of Verdun because he was starting to become a media sensation. Neville took Bataan's place and led a counterattack against the Germans and pushed them out of the gates of Adan and saved the city. For his efforts, he passed over Bataan and was made commander-in-chief after Joffre, who was fired for his failure at the Somme. Bataan was enraged that he was passed over. This began his lifelong anger towards politics and the French government as a whole. In the spring of 1917, Pétain gained worldwide recognition as one of the Entente's best generals. Journalists from all across the world came to the front to visit the mostly unknown man who threw the Germans back. Neville, who took Joffre's place as commander-in-chief, planned on following up the Battle of the Somme with another massive offensive to try to take the German salient that the Allies couldn't take in 1916. Pétain believed that the battle would end in failure due to how fortified the German lines were. Neville then removed Pétain from command of the 5th Army, saying he was not offensive-minded enough. Pétain was reduced to a minor role and was forced to watch the disaster unfold firsthand. Neville's plan not only won the support of the French government, he was also able to convince British Prime Minister Lloyd George of the plan. The plan entailed concentrating mass artillery and using creeping barrage tactics for the infantry to break past machine gun nests. The British High Command was reluctant about the offensive, but Lloyd George overruled them. Few in the lower ranks of the French army supported Neville's plan. In order to alleviate army concerns, Neville gave the plan to the rank and file. The plan then immediately fell into the hands of German spies, and the German High Command decided to abandon the salient and use scorched earth tactics. With the salient abandoned, Neville switched to the offensive and decided the attack along the Hindenburg Line. During this time, Patin worked with politicians to try and stop the offensive, but the plan continued as scheduled and ended in failure. The infantry and tanks were bogged down by mud and were thrown back, with over 90,000 casualties sustained on the first day of the offensive. On the second day, Neville continued the offensive, but this time the men refused to go forward across no man's land. The 1917 mutiny had begun. In a mass eruption of resistance, a huge portion of the French army revolted against their officers. To put down the mutiny and restore order amongst the rank and file, Pétain was made commander-in-chief and placed under Ferdinand Foch once more. Pétain promised the 50 divisions in revolt that he would raise quality of life in the trenches and reassure the men that the army would not go on the offensive until the Americans fully joined the war. Pétain believed that all the French had to do was hold off the Germans till American reinforcements arrived. In the meantime, Pétain advocated for limited offensives and prepared for the collapse of the Russian front. In 1918, Pétain met with John Pershing, the leader of the AEF, and they discussed plans for the upcoming year. Pétain came to the conclusion that the Russians were doomed and that they had to prepare for the eventuality of the Germans transferring their Eastern Front divisions to the West. During the winter and early spring, Pétain was able to reinforce the army after the mutinies and fulfill his promise to the troops on the front line. Quality of life was raised in the trenches, and thanks to Pétain's direction, supply finally met demand, and factories were able to mass-produce equipment, weapons, tanks, and fighters. In the spring, when the Germans launched their Kaiserslaw offensive, Pétain's men were ready and held off the German advance. At first, the Germans took a lot of ground against the Allies, but struggled to bring up supplies to the stormtroopers. American and French forces stopped the French at the Second Battle of the Marne. Ultimately, the offensive failed due to supply problems and the outbreak of the Spanish flu. If the German offensive stopped dead in its tracks, the Allies went on the offensive with their superiority in tanks, men, and aircraft. The Germans, seeing the writing on the wall, requested an armistice, and the war came to an end on November 11th. Pétain, like other French generals demanded harsh terms be placed on the Germans and wanted the war to continue so his troops could march into Germany and finish the fight once and for all. He believed that peace was snatched out of total victory in favor of the British. After the war, Pétain was made Marshal of France and was given his baton in 1918.